Genesis chapter 2, um, I got a text message saying that, from Linda to me, saying that she's going home, yay, and then got a text message saying, no, she's not going home, she's going to Crystal Oaks for rehab. So, pray for her, pray for Sister Bonnie, and uh, that God will watch over them and bless them. Um, I real, would really, really, really write, like for you tomorrow, since it's Roy and Bonnie's anniversary, I would like for you to go by there, or call them, or do something for them, somehow, some way, to help them with their 54th wedding anniversary. Huh? 53? Okay, I'm off by a year. Huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, I got it from him, so. Anyway, uh, so just pray for them and lift them up and uh, let them know you care about them. I'm sure that will make uh, a big difference, all right? Genesis 2 is where we're going to be tonight. And let's go to the Lord and we'll read, we'll read Genesis 2, um, we'll read, start reading the first verse all the way down to verse 7, so we'll get the general context of what's going on here. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. So God rested, so you should rest. Take a seventh day, take a Sabbath, a sabbatical, and give yourself some rest. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when, the, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant and the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist. I want you to get this idea. Instead of the rains coming down like we normally see them do, there was a mist that came up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So water came up from the ground, seeped up and evaporated, turned into fog and was lifted up above the earth. Uh, probably blocking out the sunlight to, to some extent, even though they could probably see it was daytime, but blocking out the sun a little bit. In verse, uh, let's see here, that was verse, that's farther than what I got. But anyway, um, in verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessings on tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would bless um, your word, bless the testimony of your word. I pray, Father, that you would speak to hearts tonight and fill us with knowledge. And with that knowledge, give us understanding. And through all the years, Father, of you giving us knowledge and understanding, we pray, God, that you would also give us wisdom. The wisdom from your word is valuable. It is the ultimate source of all wisdom. It is the wisdom and, and the knowledge that your word promised would be the stability of our times. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would stabilize your saints, your true saints, and help them, Father, no matter what they hear in this world. No matter what fiery dart is thrown at them from the enemy to cause them or to try to cause them to not believe this Bible. 
I pray, Father, that your word would be in them so deep, ingrained into every fiber of their being, that there is no way they would ever fall away from it. No way they would ever change their mind. So, Father, that's my prayer for these people tonight. I pray that you'd bless them. We love them. Bless those that are watching with us online. We love them. We pray, dear God, you would do the same thing for them as you're doing for us tonight, filling us with your wisdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, one of the things, and I have this up on the screen, one of the things that we know that God is doing with this moisture that's coming up from the ground is we know that he's setting up the flood. He's setting it up. Where, where does the water come from when God decides, and that's going to be a few chapters later, but where does that water come from when God decided to flood the entire earth? It didn't all come from the sky. It came from the fountains of the great deep opened up. So we know that, and we even have geologists telling us, one of the interesting things that I've heard recently, and I've got it in my Evernote somewhere, geologists have found a large body of water under the earth that is larger than any ocean that we have anywhere. And I'm going, you know, I think it's exactly what the Bible says. So here's what's happening. All of this water creeping up to the soil from underneath. So the soil that everything's growing on is, is constantly being fed with water. When plants have enough water and enough sunlight, they grow. And they grow big and they grow very, very well. So that's the two things that God is doing. He is, he's got all this water under the ground. It's seeping up into the air, but then it's going up into the upper atmosphere. And I just found there was a bunch of graphics on the internet when I was thinking about this, but this is just sort of one that I think explains it uh, better. You have, during the time before the flood now, you have the ozone layer, then you have what they called the water canopy. There was all this water's going up. Well, it keeps on going. And it's collecting in a layer up in the upper atmosphere. It's just collecting up there. And as the water rises up, more water goes up and collects in that upper atmosphere. Now, God has already said back in Genesis 2 that he divided the water's here from the waters up here and he called it the firmament or the expanse so what you have is air pressure and air pressure i mean there's a lot of pressure in air pressure air pressure is what's holding up all of this water that's up in the upper atmosphere so what what's happening is here's here's mankind he's, and he's you know living in the garden of eden and he's got everything in, in his garden is growing sufficiently for him. Adam doesn't have to do much of anything because he doesn't have to water the plants. They're being watered. Doesn't have to till them. Doesn't have to do much. He just has to go out and pick what he wants and eat what he wants. At this time, Adam and Eve are living a sort of a vegetarian lifestyle, vegetarian diet. But there's no rain at this time. No rain had ever fallen to the earth. And all of this moisture is going up into the air. And it's staying up there. Well, at some point, all of that water is going to come back down. I mean, just look at, we've got places like intersection, the intersection of Interstate 44 with 141. Who knows about that one? That's a mess. Every time there's a lot of rain, that, that place floods. And look like they'd be able to do something about it, but I'm not sure that they can because when that Merrimack River fills up, 
I mean, it goes right to that low spot and, and covers all that stuff up. So I'm not sure there's nothing they can do about it. But all this, I think, is being set up now for the flood that God is eventually going to flood the earth with. I think God is setting this up for that very reason. All right? Now, Genesis chapter 2. And I, I talked a little bit about this last Sunday night. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, anybody emailed me. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have not really been in the mood uh, to read very many emails. Um, I just I just haven't. I've got a lot on my mind. I've got a lot of things that I'm worried about. So if you've sent me an email and you think it's important, send it again. And if I haven't read it, send it again. If I haven't read it, send it again. Get my attention. And um, But I had mentioned last Sunday night about the difference between humans and animals. And in this case here, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. You don't see any place in scriptures where God took a horse and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Where God took a dog and gave him his breath of life. Where God took a goldfish and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You don't see any other creature on earth wherein is the very breath of life that God has given that creature. Do they breathe? Yes, obviously. They're all air breathers. Even fish are. Fish are air breathers. They just gather in it from the water. Everything's an air breather. But there isn't another one whereby God has given of his own breath, giving man a living soul. So... No, I do not believe your dog goes to heaven. I do not believe it. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable. I'm sorry if you don't like that answer. But it's not, there's nothing in scripture that tells me that God has given animals a, a living soul and that they had the ability to choose whether or not to pee on the carpet or pee outside. They just, I, they don't have the ability to know the difference between what's right and what is wrong. Okay? That is reserved specifically for man. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul makes use of this one passage where God made Adam a living, a, a living creature by giving him his breath of life. He, he made man unique. This is, where, this is where all the evolutionists are wrong. Evolution is wrong according to the Bible. Do not believe evolution. I never will believe in evolution. You don't, and you cannot dig up enough bones to convince me that there's evolution. I marvel at the evidence that they bring forth to show evolution. They, they'll bring out, they'll bring out a skull of an ape. And they'll say, this is Apopithecus, Apopithecus homos, ape that becomes man or something like that. But they, they want you, to me, it's an ape. It's a monkey. They dug up the skull of a monkey and said, this is our, this is our grandfather's. No, it's not. It's a monkey. Amen. I don't believe it. Never will believe it. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Now, let me just throw a little conspiracy theory at you. Okay? 
to me, the whole reason behind trying to convince everybody that we have evolved from a lower state to a higher state is this. We are now on the verge of bringing about our next phase of evolution. We are on the we are on the verge of creating methods by which the brain can be linked into the internet. We're on the verge of being able to change the genetics of mankind to make him stronger, give him better eyesight, cure his diseases, so that he becomes, in essence, one of the gods, just like Satan promised in Genesis chapter 3. The purpose of evolution is it, it not so much about how we came from a lower state to this state. It's all about how we are going to go from this state to a higher state, a higher level. And now you have scientists all over the world who are firmly convinced that the next phase of man's evolution is not going to happen by accident. It's going to be done deliberately. Do you believe that? We're going to augment man's DNA. We're going to augment man technologically. We're going to link him with the World Wide Web, with computers. He will be able to access with his mind every bit of information that he could ever want. And we're on the verge of that. Elon Musk is spending millions of dollars building these machines because he, he, he really thinks that this is how it's going to happen. Elon Musk, the guy that started PayPal, came out a couple years ago and said, I'm very afraid of what computers are going to have the ability to do in the next few years. We're going to have artificial intelligence that basically is going to... If every movie you've ever seen about how the computers take over the world and kill all the humans, he said that's what's going to happen. And he was serious about it. So his, his solution to solving that problem was... Let's let us become the computers. Let us be part of them and them part of us. That way they won't kill us. And whatever, however smart they are, we will be that intelligent. Whatever they can do, we'll be able to do. And if they're linked in with everybody else, then we will be linked in with everybody else and we will know what everybody's thinking all the time. We will not have to talk. We will just transmit thoughts one to another. Instead of you texting a message while you're driving, which you ought not do, you will just think, I need to tell so-and-so something and boom, you just told them. Okay, I'm telling you, that's coming. That is coming. Okay, so... Uh, why was I saying all that? Anyway, that's, that's the part of evolution. Man is about to be brought to that next phase of evolution. And man's going to do it to himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is actually quoting uh, Genesis chapter 2 where God breathed into Adam's nostrils his breath and, and made him a living soul. So 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, who's the last Adam? Jesus. Christ. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first Adam made a living soul. Last Adam is a quickening spirit, which means that he in us can make us alive. Amen. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural 
and afterward that which is spiritual. And all of this is about order. God is a God of order. This is how God does everything that he does. The first thing that he does is good. The second thing that he does is better. Amen? Your first birth was good. Everybody went, oh, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Back in when you were born, back when you were born, the doctor come out and said, it's a boy. Nowadays, we know that. We didn't know that for five months. That's not a mystery. Okay. But the first man was good. But the second time you're born is going to be far better. Amen. It's going to be glorious. Amen. So that's what, that's what he's pointing out. First man, Adam was made the living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward that which is natural. So Joel Osteen's book is wrong. When he says your best life now, he's wrong. He's lying. Your best life is not now. Your best life is waiting for you. The second one. Amen? Amen. I, don't want, this, this, I don't want what God is going to ultimately give me here because it'll be vanity to away. It'll be lost. You give me my... Inter you give me my everlasting inheritance right now, I'll blow it in a matter of months. That's what people do. Okay? But that everlasting inheritance, if I wait until I die and then accept it, I'll hang on to it forever and forever and forever. And that's what he's saying here. So verse 47, the first man is of the earth Earthy. That's why he was called Adam. Adam means of the earth, like red earth, clay. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, which is us. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. That's going to be our second birth. And he... And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Somebody say amen. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So I do not want my best life now. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. What's coming out of the grave is that new body that we cannot even fathom what it looks like. We have no idea how it's, but we know it's going to be glorious. Amen. Amen. Genesis, now back to Genesis 2. Let's look at the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Boy, oh boy. Adam. I mean, I believe the devil knew what he was doing. Ladies, you know I love you. You know I don't, I don't try to degrade women in any way. But the truth is. That God made the woman the weaker vessel. Okay? He made her the weaker vessel for a reason. To the, in the spiritual realm, Christ is the head, we are the body. And we are the weaker vessel 
to G compared to Jesus Christ. Amen? So does that make you feel a little bit better? Okay. So, but God has a glorious purpose for you, has a glorious life for you, has a glorious reason why he made you a woman. Genesis 2, verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So I'll stop right here. So imagine then this beautiful, amazing garden that God had planted for Adam. And you've got apple trees and peach trees and pear trees and banana trees and pomegranate trees and grapevines and figs. And you've got oranges, tangerines, you've got nectarines. I mean, you've got everything there to make yourself sick on if you want. It's when it's, uh, when it's pit, peach picking season. First time Lisa and I went picking peaches. They take you out in a little wagon, pull you with a tractor, and they take you out to these peach tree, and you can pick and eat all you want. And I'm doing that. I feel them, make sure they're, they're that perfect ripe. And I pull them, spit out that seed. And I mean, I'm just down in these things. And I, I got, it's time to go. Lisa said, are you ready to go? Yeah, I better go. I better stop. So I got back on the, on the wagon and I'm holding these two peaches because I was going to eat them. And I'm going, I can't do it. This is back before I had stomach surgery. So you can imagine how many peaches. I, I could put a lot of peaches in there. And I did. And so I ended up putting them in the bag. Because then, you know, whatever goes in the bag, they weigh and you pay for it. And the lady told me, I, I, she saw me turning green. And she said, that's nothing. There was a guy that downed like 25 peaches. Sucked down 25 peaches. He got so sick, we literally had to pick him up and put him in this wagon. And just hoping that he wasn't going to throw up all over everybody. It was bad. Okay? But you see, and what I'm, say, what I'm saying to you was, it was good. Now, Adam had it good. He had it good. God was feeding him. He had access to vegetables, fruit, grains, everything. He had access to it. All right? Him and Eve both. But there was one tree. One tree. Out of thousands of them, God said, don't eat. So... It says, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil are opposites. Okay? So ponder that for a minute. So now look. Revelation 2. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Which now is in the midst of the paradise of God. So here's what, we're, here's what we're learning from this. That Eden here was a foreshadowing of the paradise of God that is in heaven. God built Eden to match his beautiful garden in heaven. And Adam lived in heaven on earth. He had everything. He had it all. The only thing that he couldn't eat was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Revelation 22. 
And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the mouth of the throne, or proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of, of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and, and, his, servants shall, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. So we know in the new Jerusalem, a couple of things that's going to happen. Number one, for the very first time, Mankind is going to be able to see the face of God and live through it. Because right now, if God were to show his face in this building, it would kill every single one of us. The glory that comes out of God would be so blinding and so terrible, it would kill every one of us. We wouldn't survive it. But in this case, now that we have perfected bodies, now for the first time ever we get to see the face of God. Hallelujah. I can't wait. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My problem is, I've not seen Jesus. I've not seen Jesus. But I trust that when he appears, I'll know him. I'll know who he is. So the paradise of the paradise of Eden is a picture of the paradise of heaven. And man is in paradise. Now. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. And his commandments are, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commandments. For without are what? Your dog is not waiting for. For you in heaven. It's not. Dogs. Sorcerers. Whoremongers. Murderers. Idolaters. And whosoever loveth. And maketh. A lie. People listen. Listen. The people that are lying to you. The people that are lying about you. Have lied about you. Have told lies. They're not going to get away with it. God has recorded every lie. He's recorded that in a book. And he's kept it all these years. And one of these days, somebody's going to stand before God and think, well, I've done pretty good in this life, until they open the book and they start reading out all the things that they did and all the lies that they told. And I think that person is going to remember every one of those. I think that person's not going to say, uh, I, I don't remember that one. I think they're going to go, oh, you heard that one. So everybody that's lying to you, lying about you, lying against you, or just plain lying, especially those who have a YouTube channel, All those lies are written down. God's going to read them out one of these days. They will not be allowed to gain access to this tree of life. Because God had to kick Adam and Eve out, remember? So Genesis chapter 2. 
Verse 10, and river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, and that is which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and there is bdellium, the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is that compasses the land of, whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, that is it which goes toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, I may be wrong, I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, the only river that survived the flood was Euphrates. That's, I don't know, I, I'm not positive about this, I can't say 100%. But I don't believe that there exists anymore the river Pison, um, the river Gihon, the river Hittikel. I don't, I don't recall those being in any map anywhere. But I know that Euphrates is. And there's four, he's mentioning four rivers here. Now anytime I see the number four, I always think that this has something to do with the realm of the spirit realm. In a lot of the in a lot of mythology, there is a river that separates our world from hell. Back in the old days when they buried somebody, they put coins on their eyes. Because they believed they had to pay the ferryman, the guy who was going to transport the person's soul across the river to the underworld. And those coins were used to pay the ferryman to transport them to life into the underworld. Now, I don't believe that. But I believe that there is a, a river that separates... This universe from heaven and this universe from hell. When the Israelites were going to go into the promised land, how did they get there? They had to cross the Jordan River. Had to. To get to the other side. So you look at these verses and say, okay, that's interesting, but why are they there? I think that it's there to tell you that there is a river. Now, one thing I know about the river Euphrates is that right now there are devils that are bundled up under the river Euphrates in Revelation 9 that are going to be released and go boo and scare everybody or whatever it is they're going to do. So I think that that has a spiritual connection to it. I think that it's very possible that there literally is a river that separates our world from heaven where God is and that we sing songs about crossing that river crossing Jordan I won't have to cross Jordan alone we sing songs like that all the time and I think that this little section of the Bible here has a lot to do that I think it's trying to tell you that okay so now turn to Genesis 2 15 and we're going to stop here Boy, I like this. I'll never forget the first time I counted this. It blessed me. Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it, and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree, the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, 
thou shalt surely die. And I counted those words. Those are 39 words that God spoke. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. So what God was giving Adam was, was like a foreshadowing of the law. And we don't have time to get into it tonight, but what I may show you next week is right as of this point, since there's a law, now there can be a sin. Before God said this, there's no sin because there's no law. But God spoke these words established it as his law and said, Adam, don't eat that tree. Now what's interesting to me, and we we'll, may cover this, Satan did not go to Adam. He did not go to Adam. He went to the weaker vessel to do what he did. Okay? So you ponder that. But you, what you have here is what I call the proto-law. It's a foreshadowing of the 39 books of the Old Testament. That's the law. And God said, here's all these things that I want you to do and don't break them, but people break them. And they do it all the time. Good people do. God's people break them. So God had already provided a way. God knew what Eve was going to do. God knew what the serpent was going to do. And God had already prepared the lamb that was to be slain from the foundation of the world for all of those who broke God's covenant. All of them. Father, we love your word. It's very rich. It's very deep. I thank you for it. I thank you for all that it says, what it is, what it does. Father, I don't perform your law. Your laws are engrafted in me. And they're just part of who I am now. Father, I thank you for that. Thank you for these people that have come out to join with us tonight. I pray that you'd bless them. Bless their homes, bless their families. Help them, dear God, as they do their own study. Father, that there would be agreement in your word. We ask your blessings now and as you dismiss us. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.